Okay, today we're talking about uh, TCP/IP and the protocol suite. Um, somebody's class was covering it the other day, and they actually had some of the students had no idea what the heck this even was. So we're going to cover what this is. I'm not going to go into too much detail on some things. I wanted to do some demos of it, but I can't. So I have screenshots of stuff, but you know, we'll see. Okay. Well. Alright, TCPIP is a suite of protocols made popular from the internet. This was a handmade drawing on a napkin when they originally conceived the internet. It had four nodes. It was uh, USC Berkeley, SRI, I can't remember what school that is, uh, Utah, and UCLA. I can't remember SLI, but this was the original design for the internet. Isn't that kind of cool? So, yeah, that was in December 1969, written on a napkin. So, started off as the ARPANET, Advanced Research, whatever, something, something. But, uh, there you go. Okay. And it also had DARPANET, which was for defense. And what they really did was the Internet original plan was for military. Okay. I don't know if any, I know he's in the military now, but at least when I, like when I was over in Saudi Arabia, I could call home for free anytime I wanted to, but I basically it was the priority. So I had the lowest priority on the phone lines. So no, words, there's lines all over the world. So the military was using those communication lines to start the original internet. Okay. Well, then he decided to bring on educational institutions, hence UCLA, UC, uh, Santa Barbara, and then at that after that we started with the whole. Uh, that's where the internet started. Remember CompuServe and Prodigy and AOL? They're all gone but AOL. You know, people still use AOL? It's $200 million a year. Now, I actually was at a conference where the guy, head guy at AOL, he was like, oh, yeah, we're doing a booming business. I'm like, why? Why? <laughs> why? 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 Yeah, they are. They're, literally, there's people... I have to have it. Why? Because that's everybody knows me there. I'm like, tell me your new address. I said, you ever move houses? <laughs> oh, but, no. Oh, it's like, I have people who have just the Yahoo email. I said, seriously? you got to at least get a Gmail because Yahoo's nothing but crap. But, okay. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, and I've been told that I say a lot of bad words in my presentations. So, oh, well. <laughs> like crap. They don't make band-aids. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So TCP/IP is actually not the fastest protocol suite out there. IPX, SPX is so much faster, but it was not made the standard. IPX, SPX was used on Novell Linux systems, so TCP/IP became the standard, and everybody started using it. Like Apple used to use Apple Talk. So I mean, way back when, you know, when I first got one of my very first commercial clients was aerospace reports when I worked at a tinker a guy they worked at tinker wrote a software application for him he's like you know they got a network out there they need help he said I'm going to tell you a front I don't know anything about networking but I set it up and it works but it's oh my god slow so I went out there he literally if you remember NT4 days he basically went in and turned on every service Every server, every protocol, NetBuoy, IPX, everything was turned on, and it worked. So they really freaked out when I just started deleting them. I'm like, uninstall, uninstall, un what are you doing? I'm like, trust me, it's going to be better. And it did. It was amazingly after that point. They hired me on the spot because they're like, wow, it actually works now. So they got me a job. But TCP is, is, was the original Internet protocol, okay? All right, it's a suite. Two main protocols, TCP and IP. But there's also UDP and others, which we're going to talk about some of those. Okay, all right. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. Okay, it's a connection oriented. Again, I made these slides today, so there's probably typos everywhere. But so it's one of the two main. It allows for what's called established of a connection between hosts. So if I want to talk to Baron back there, I can actually make a connection to Baron. Communicate. And we, we, we can keep track of the packets. We know what's happening. So, all right. So, um, it says it allows for connection oriented, which I talked about, and allows also for in order delivery. If you don't know how the internet works, well, imagine I'm in the grocery store and I got a big old cart of groceries. 
I go to the checkout line, what happens to my groceries? They scan them and then do what with them? Put in a whole bunch of different bags. Then the bags are transported, not necessarily in a certain order, to my car. I drive home. Then they get transported to my kitchen counter. And then they get dismantled again. Okay? It's kind of like the internet works. We get our data. You know, say I'm gonna I'm going to Google or something. I send a request to Google. Google takes whatever they're sending me, say it's a big bunch of something, breaks it up into a bunch of packets, and sends them to me. Now, it would be nice if they all went the same way, but they don't. Sometimes packets take different routes. We have what's called sequence numbers, which I didn't really get into on the presentation, but there's a 32-bit number, a very large number, that is randomly selected. Okay? And what happens at that point, say me and Patrick are here, we're going to communicate. Okay? I pick a random number, and from that point on, every time I send Patrick a packet, I keep incrementing it by one. And he sends me an acknowledgement number the same way. He picks a number to start, then he increments by one. So if the packet comes out of order, we can put them back in order. Okay? And there's also something called sliding window. What sliding window is, is uh, it really doesn't affect us much anymore. But did, did anyone use the internet back when we had like 9,600 baud modems? I think, yeah, very few of us. Okay? But back then, and it was very slow. I know you guys are like, seriously? Yeah, bro. I use a 2400 baud. I actually learned on the 300 baud modem. I remember learning in a room a little bit larger than this. They had computers on both sides. You would type your message, walk over, and watch the characters appear on the other side of the room. It was that fast. But, um, so we, um, where was I going with that? So we have our sequence numbers, and, well, we start off by sending a, we'll say a set number pack. We'll say five packets. So me and Patrick are going to talk. We start by sending five packets to him. He receives all five successfully. I'm like, oh, wow, that went pretty easy. Let's go for six. So I keep increasing the number of packets I send to him at a time before he has to acknowledge them. Okay? And then, you know, when you get to a point where he's, he's missing one, at that point it's kind of a threshold of how much our communication channel can handle. And then we can, like, you know, back off and everything. But... Way back when, when you're, you know, wanting to make your internet faster, you could actually increase the TCPI win, TCPIP window size in the registry. Remember, it originally was set up on a 2400 baud modem. Then it went to, uh, you know, 9600, and, you know, so on and so forth. So you could actually go in and tweak that. So instead of starting off at 5, it could start off at 10. So it just makes your internet a little bit faster. Okay. I'll cover the three-way handshake, but I put it on a different slide. But we're going to cover that in a little bit. Internet protocol, in other words, IP, again, the other part of this suite, handles formatting the packets and addressing. Okay? So, if I take an envelope in my house, I know some of you have probably never done this in your life, but if you take an envelope and write an address on it, does that mean it's going to get there? It's just addressed. It's kind of like if I put a, a IP address on a packet, is it going to get there? Really, IP is just worried about the addressing of it. Okay, TCP is the one to make sure it gets there. So TCP is the postal service. IP is really just the address on the letter. Okay, you see the difference? Okay. We have two flavors of IP. We have version 4 and version 6. Version 4, we ran out of addresses, I think, two years ago. Okay. It's kind of like, remember the old, well, some, again, you're way too young. But way back when, when we first came out with computers, you had 640K of RAM. I want to remember that. <laughs> there was like two of us to do. But uh, I upgraded to one mega RAM. Then I upgraded to two. I actually had to buy the nine individual SIP chips to upgrade my memory to two megs of RAM. A couple years later, I bought 16 megs more. How much did I spend for 16 megabytes? Not gigs. 16 megs. What do you think? 600 bucks. 16 megs of RAM. So, you know, IP4 was a great idea initially. Initially. Okay. Now we have IP version 6. I was actually reading an article a year or so ago when they ran out of addresses. And they were saying, oh, we're out of IP4 addresses. We're switching to IP version 6. You must replace all your equipment. Totally false. IPv6 is 100% backwards compatible. So, which is a good thing. Very good thing. All right. 
IPv4 versus v6. IPv4 is a 32-bit address. Okay. Theoretically, four billion addresses. You can't use them all. There's a lot of reserved and other stuff like that. But if we could use all of the 32-bit, four billion addresses. So if every people on the world, on the earth, you each get about 0.66 of an address. So we don't have enough even for one for each person. Even if we could use them all, which we can't. Okay. IP version 6, we have a few more. Okay. It's that many. Whatever that many is. I don't even know what that many is. 34 on Yeah. Well, basically, every person on the earth can have 50 octillion IP addresses. That's quite a few. Okay? So, I don't think we're going to run out for a while. But again, we've said stuff like that before. Okay. Does anyone have any of the Internet of Things? You know, the you're starting to get all the different Internet stuff at your house? You know? Me. Wi-Fi is making headway. What is? A 10 gigabit Wi-Fi. Oh, nice. But it's the only thing, the only problem is it can only be used for short distance because it uses a shorter range. I guess it has to pump just that much. Yeah, well... So We're seeing a lot. Okay. Used to talk between like your computer and like a close by <clears throat> right. router. So. That'd be cool. There was an article which I tried to find. It was something about they're going to be flying drones around giving internet. Can't remember which company it was going to be, but okay. So I connected to my house on port eighty eighty. Okay, I use what's called dynamic DNS. Whole another subject. But I connect it to my house, and I can see that at this very moment, I'm generating... Wow, is, it, is the sun going down? Must be. I'm only generating 50 watts of electricity. So, next Thursday, this is going to be up there. Okay. But, basically, I have an IP address assigned to my solar system. I have an IP address assigned to my uh, energy, you know, total energy detector. I want every camera in my alarm system, my thermostat... My light's in my hallway. I have, I'm assuming some of you have that kind. I know Baron does. Okay. I was talking to someone today. <coughs> the only thing wireless he has is one cell phone. Wow. He has his computer plugged into his router with a cable and one cell phone. I'm like, wow. you know, I looked at my routing, <laughs> my list of IP addresses the other day. I must have had like, you know, 50 some odd devices connected to my network at home because of all the different things I have. So, we're going to get more and more of that as we go. Okay. So, IPv6, a lot bigger. I'm going to cover those two a little bit more. The top, we have what's called an IPv4 header. The bottom is IPv6. Okay. First of all, you can notice immediately that the address space is different. It's a lot larger on the bottom. You all see that? Yeah. Look at the source and destination up here. Look at the source and <coughs> destination down there. So the address space is much, much larger. We're not going to go into all of this, but we have a, a header checksum here. See that? What a checksum is, is think of it as a mathematical calculation to see if something's correct. Kind of like an MD5 hash. Some of you might have heard about that. Okay, Forensics, you really know what those are now. They did a massive project in them. But, so we, we calculate a checksum on the header. See that? Is it missing on the bottom? There's no checks on there, is there? First time I saw that, I'm like, whoa. Why are we removing the checksum? Again, checksum is to calculate if something's got screwed up. Well, why do we remove it? Well, the header contains something called TTL, time to live. I'll explain what that is. So you send a packet across the internet. What happens if it got lost? Do you just want it to cruise around forever? Right. Packets start off at different values. I'm pretty sure a Linux system starts off at 64. I think Windows starts off at 128. There's different ver values they start at. Every time a packet goes through a router, it's decremented. So sooner or later, it's going to hit zero, then it's thrown in the trash bucket. Okay. So since it actually gets decremented every time, the header would change. Do you agree? So they're going to have to they're having to recalculate that checksum every single time it goes through a router. You're like, wow, doesn't that sound like a waste? It is. It's a lot. 
since it requires it to be rechecked every single time. It's already done to get the IP layer, so why do it twice? So, and you don't, you don't think about it much, but you know, I read an article about American Airlines. I'm assuming you all know American Airlines is. Anyone ever flown first class before? Seriously? None of you. Okay. Well, they give you weird food in first class. And they, 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 there was an article about the Waldorf salad they give in American Airlines. Well, includes olives. They lowered the number of olives by one and saved a million dollars a year. I'm like, what? But if you think of the number of olives they use, it's like, they're like, yes, we're lowering the number of olives by one and we'll save a million dollars. I'm like, that's crazy. Okay. Well, by getting rid of one checksum, theoretically, that could be a massive increase in speed if you think about it. Because remember, I had to calculate it at every single router. Now we're not having to do that. <coughs> so far, so good. Is there anybody like totally lost? Okay. Is there anyone not admitting they're totally lost? Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about each one of these protocols. Okay. TCP and UDP, which I really didn't get a chance to get in. I've been very busy all day today and had to go to a meeting and all this other stuff, but I got most of it on there. TCP is the connection oriented, UDP is not. Yeah, okay. Um, let me explain what the UDP is. UDP originally was used for like broadcast traffic, kind of like printing. You know, you send your data to the printer way back when they used UDP because you really didn't need to know that every packet made it to the printer. It just printed. And it was also used for streaming, video streaming. I mean, think about it. If you're watching Netflix and you lose a packet, what happens? Does the movie stop? No, it continues on. So you really don't need to know. About, and it was actually faster. Um, nowadays, more things are going over to TCP now that our networks are getting faster and faster. Everybody notice that Cox now has their... Gigablast, that's what it is. Yes, Gigablast here now. Not available in my house. Darn it. Um, yeah, I have 200 meg service now. It went, you know, remember, I had 9,600 baud modem. 200 meg is like, I, I don't think I've seen a buffering sign ever. I can download two gigs in like eight seconds. It's like, but yeah, it's, you know, y'all know why they're doing that. Because Google's probably coming here soon. Yeah, and then you're going to get it for free. So, yeah. Okay. But, so we're going to talk about some of these protocols. This is the area where some people had some issues. Okay. All right, we're going to talk about Telnet, FTP, TFTP, and, you know, and a few others. So, Telnet is terminal emulation. Okay. It was widely used. Okay. Mainly used for remote access. I can't show it to you here because it's no longer installed on our machines. I would have to go in and... Which sucks. I mean, I love telling that, but it's no longer installed by default on Windows machines. Anyone notice that? It's like not I there. Know. All that stuff in like Cyber Patriot is made about Telnet, and it's like you never see it anymore. I know they. They well, the reason is it's not secure. It's not secure. Yeah, it's, they make yeah. a big deal about it. It's like yeah. you maybe find it an XP machine. Right. From way back. Right. I mean, you can install it if you go into the control panel in the Windows features. You can click a button and it goes right there. I mean, it's on your system. It's just not registered and it's not fully installed. But uh. So, unsecured, the way you use it is you type Telnet, then the IP address, and then the port. The default port on this one is, T is 23, TCP 23. Now, this was also very handy for testing things. You want to test your mail server, you can Telnet to your mail server. You just change the port to 25. You want to, you know, test whatever you want to test, you literally could just change the port number, which was awesome. Um, I used to manage my ISP using it. Not a great idea because it's, again, unsecure. I will, you know, um, I ran an ISP. Let me show you this here real quick. Okay, if you go to... Doesn't mean you're going to stalk me now. Okay. Go here. And if you go here... Thursday, this whole roof's going to be covered with solar panels, and this whole roof's going to be covered with solar panels. But, back here in this back building, right here, 
I used to run an ISP. Basically, Internet Service Provider. I had three T1s, which is... Well, I ran it back in 2000. That was a very fast connection. It was full digital. See, cable is not so much. Um, let's take a caveat here for a second. Do y'all know how cable works? Do, you, um, do they... Well, actually, now it's different now. But the way they used to do it was they would send you the, the amount... You know, if your cable is so... Think of the data it can carry. Three quarters of it was for television. One quarter of it, you know, was for uploading to the internet. That kind of stuff. Basically, it was all the different channels on there, and you know, so that's what our cable was. Now it's actually different. I think they switched what a year ago. Now, when you pick a channel, it then send a request to Cox to send you that channel. You're no longer getting all of them. There's a name for it. Does anyone know what the name is? There's a new name for it. But you no longer get all the channels. You actually request one, and they said that's how they're increasing our internet speed because we're not—they're not sending me all 400 crappy channels anymore. Now they're just sending me what I need. Okay, but I ran an ISP out of that for many, many years. I had multiple T1s out there, and um, I worked at Rose. A lot of times I had to do stuff remotely. One thing you never, ever want to do is remotely edit a router. <laughs> the ACL. <laughs> I did it. And as soon, you know, I basically I took off the ACL. I'm like, oh, crap. So I had to run home real quick and put it back on. The way you do it is you remotely get into an internal system at your home network. And then from that system, you can edit the router. Yes, you'll still lose your connection, but it's going to be able to put the ACL back in. But yeah, I, I remember doing that. It wasn't good. But so telling it is still you say we still use it here in our lab okay that's what it looks like i mean if you actually looked at the data it actually sends the data through twice so when i did a project at the university of tulsa capturing telling that it was really freaking me out it literally echoed everything okay you actually came in you missed free lunch okay so telling it was great now it's replaced with ssh secure shell okay I don't have a picture of a secure shell, but imagine telling it on steroids is pretty much what it is. It actually uses certificates, and, and it will work without one, but it actually encrypts the data. That's the big deal. Okay, it encrypts your data. Okay. Here's what Wireshark and Telnet look like. You know, basically, TCB and Telnet data. I mean, there's really not much to see there. Okay. So make a connection to it, and if I was showing you the bottom pane, you could actually see the data in clear text if it was text. Okay, so telling it not so good, um, but it is still used. It's like routers. I think they come default with telling that turn on, don't they? Yeah, I think they do. Yeah. All right, FTP file transfer protocol works on two different ports, twenty and twenty-one. Now I'm telling you all these ports. But they don't have to be those numbers. You can change them. For instance, I used, uh, which I'm not going to cover RDP. RDP is remote desktop protocol. When I ran my business way back when, I would remotely get into all kinds of systems all over the city from here at Rose State. Rose State blocks 3389. That's the remote desktop port. So if I want to connect to Barron's system from here and they block 3389, what do you do? Change the port. So I just scanned Rose's network. They had, they had 20, 20, 21 open. They had a 505 open. They had all these different ports open. So what I did is I went into the remote system said, oh, uh, RDP, you're now using 23. No, no, I did 20. I did 20. Yeah, I did 20. And then uh, I would just connect because when you use a, a remote desktop protocol, you can tell it the port. Just like telling you, you can say system and then a port. So basically, I told it to connect on port 20, and I connect all day long. And it was funny, our network administrator back then, he knew what I was doing, but he knew I wasn't causing any issues. So he comes by when he goes, man, Ken, you've been telnetting for days. <laughs> said, yeah, he goes, you got a lot of telnet going on there, because what? Yeah, I basically tunneled over port 20. So, you know, and back... Even before I ran my own ISP, I worked for another ISP, and even before that I used another ISP, this guy would never use default settings for anything other than the web server port. 
I mean, imagine a Linux machine where every directory name is different, every port name is different. I mean, it's very secure. If you break into a system, you don't know what the heck's going on. But that's what I learned on. Then I go to a real system, and I'm like, oh, wow. You know, one that's not been modified. But FTP, I'm going to show you. I can actually show you a demo of this one. Okay, I'm going to type FTP to FTP.NEI.com. NEI is Network Associates International Mac McAfee, whatever. And you can log in with Anonymous. And they wanna, you have to give your email address. So I always use Ken at here.com. They don't check it. They just need one in the format of an email address. So what I did was I made a connection to them. FTP is unsecure. So if you were capturing traffic right now, the entire world could see it. They can see my password. But again, it's just a bogus email address. Now, I can't do DIR. Oh, I can do DIR now. Normally, you just do LS. But, uh, yeah, you can see, like, I did LS, and it told me the directories. Like, say I wanted to update my antivirus. CD to virus deaths. LS, CD into 4.x. There you go. There's the two dot files. See them right there at the bottom? 4086 and, four, and uh, I'm sorry, 8064 and 8065. Then I could type get or put, and to get a file, put a file, and get the I used to do this all the time because when I ran my business, I need to get updates, and sometimes it was just easier to get them myself. So FTP, very handy to use, very fairly quick, but unsecured. Um, actually, I want to, when you're done, you say bye. I want to connect again real quick. Okay. Now, you see at the top here? Well, it says connected to 114447. I know you can't read it from back there, but it's telling me that I'm using SPFTP 1.0.0.0. Basically, that is the system I'm connected to, the software they're using. It's called enumeration. We, now we know what system they're doing. So if there was a vulnerability for that system, I know a little bit more about their system, and then I can possibly exploit it. When I was, excuse me, at University of Tulsa, I was assigned an FTP server. And I had to secure it. What we did was that we built our systems, and then without any updates or patching or anything, someone came in and analyzed it. So another team came in and analyzed my FTP server. And they basically said there was an enumeration vulnerability, because mine was a Microsoft NT4 FTP server. Well, they connected to my my server and immediately said, Microsoft FTP version, blah, 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 whatever it was. I said, there's a vulnerability there because now they know what it is. Any idea how to fix it? Well, I had to, I had to keep FTP running because that was my job. I was an FTP server. And if you know the whole CIA triangle, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, if I'm an FTP server, I have to be available. And I had to run FTP. So they're like, sorry, you can't fix that. So you're going to have a ding on your report. Because it is a... No, they were wrong. I actually went in. I There was an FTP DLL. I went and turned the service off. I brought up a hex editor. And I searched through the actual binary of the DLL for the signature. Microsoft FTP version blah, blah, blah. And I replaced it with an exact string, the same link. Don't you wish you knew whatever. <laughs> Saved it. Connect next time. Don't you wish you knew whatever. So it was pretty awesome. So, and they're like, how the hell did you do that? I'm like, you know, see, way back when, some of you already know this story, but when I joined the military, I went to Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. And back in Commodore 64 days, I realized, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those, had a game called Aces, a little flight simulator game. Well, we, you know, I, had, I was the only one in the dorm with a computer, so they all come in my room. We played this game, and basically, we, you know, we play. And so this one guy kept getting the high score, and we quit for the night. Well, I wanted to beat his score every night, but I wasn't about to stay up all night beating his score. So I would just bring up a hex editor, go into the answer file, change my score to just above his, and hit save. Go to bed. Next day, he's like, what the heck? So he'd literally be in there playing forever until he beat my score. Then he'd quit and go to bed. <laughs> I'd open it back up, change my score up just a little bit. He'd say, that went on for weeks. He got the point where he spent his entire weekend just trying to beat my score. 
I said he beat it. Then he leave. Five minutes later, I beat it. I'm done. He said, like, "How did you possibly beat my score?" But yeah, it was. <laughs> it was pretty funny. But so, just because someone tells you, "Hey, there's a vulnerability now," or "No, you're running whatever FTP," there's always ways around things. You just got to think a little weird. Okay. So FTP, very handy protocol, but it's unsecure. You can use SFTP, which is a secure version of FTP. Okay. If you're transferring things like a antivirus DAT file, do we really care? No. <laughs> if I'm transferring a bunch of pictures, I don't care. But when it comes down to it, you know, if it's something critical, you need to watch that. Well, it depends on what the pictures are. That's true. It depends on what the pictures are. Yes. Okay. All right. TFTP, trivial. FTP, for trivial file transfer. Works on UDP 69 and 8099. That's what a Barron's class is going to use. It's mainly used to get and put files for routers. Does anyone know of a use beyond that? I mean, TFTP, I think that's pretty much the only thing it's used for. It's be annoying. It's be annoying. You basically can use it to get and put your configuration. Maybe you're configuring your router, and maybe someone lost an entire configuration and couldn't find it. This guy right here... Yeah, quick story. This is a couple weeks ago when vSphere went down. Well, Roy, in his infinite wisdom, oh no, it's down. I will literally unplug every cable. <laughs> okay. Then he plugs the switch in wrong. He lost the entire config for the switch. He's freaking out. I find an old version. He's trying to put it back in. We can't get it to go in. I said, Roy, are you sure you plugged it in? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he didn't. Basically, we were trying to put the router config on a switch because you know, we were all war nervous and stuff. Turn, turn, yeah, turn, <laughs> turn off. The point is the router was fine. You just had to plug back in wrong. It's right. like, ugh. Okay. But TFTP is mainly used for that. That's kind of what it looks like. You copy the configuration over. Okay. All right. SMTP. Simple Mail Transport Protocol. It uses port 25 normally used to send an email. It's unsecure as well. Okay? So many people... Th I'm brand new lawyer guy downstairs, Adam Bush, was showing me his email the other day. Uh, he does, you know, uses a lot of his personal email accounts. I'm like... So they're all set up with POP3 through a network solutions. I'm like, so, are you using SSL? He's like, what's that? Well, email does support encryption, but you got to turn it on. And it has to the server has to support it. Well, he didn't have it turned on. So I showed him, and then, you know, I don't know if he ever got it turned on. But by default, email is, is unencrypted. It's literally in clear text. Okay? There is SMTPS for secure. Okay? Uses support 465. And I mean, most of you probably have Google, which is using encryption anyway. Okay? The problem with the email is the from address can be forged. Just like that letter you can mail at your house, you know, when you put a letter on it, you know, an address on it. I actually was lecturing over this one day for a guy who worked at the Postal Service. I mean, he was in my class. I was lecturing, and he was in there, and he worked at the Postal Service. So, say I wanted to send my grandma in Connecticut a letter, okay? So, I address it for grandma in Connecticut. What do I put in the top left-hand corner? Should be my address. No, no, no. You put my grandma's address in Connecticut. You do not put a stamp on it. It goes to grandma's address in Connecticut. Oh, no postage, return to sender. Goes right back to grandma's house in Connecticut, and she gets it for free. And the guy was like, that's ingenious. It actually works. Not telling you to do that. But just like the return address on an email... I'm just like the return address on that letter, you can spoof or forge the address on an email as well. I can very easily go into my mail client and say, my name is Bill Gates and Microsoft, you know, B, yeah, B, I think, this is B Gates, isn't it? Or is it Bill G? Whatever it is, at Microsoft.com. Oh, he does. He does. They're all public. Oh, yeah. um, back when I used to do a lot of work with Dell, um, it was funny because I, I bought a server from Dell. Actually, I bought two identical servers from Dell. They were both dual processor capable. I didn't have the money at the time, so I didn't get the dual processor. About a month later, I bought the second processor for one of the servers. No problem. 
About a month later after that, it went to buy the second processor for the other server. They kept sending me the wrong part. Literally, over and over, they kept sending me the wrong part. And I'm like, sorry, that's the correct part. I'm like, no, it's the wrong part. And so I just emailed Michael Dell at Dell.com. Amazing. I literally had the part the very next morning, the correct part. So it, you can't just email everybody. But okay. The way SMTP works is you actually send a hello message. It's not a typo. That's actually what it is. It could be E E H L O as well. But and you can't really see it there, but that's in clear text as well. Okay. When I ran my ISP, I handled mail for plenty of people. Like I did all of Bart Connor's gymnastics and just all these other websites. But my log files were straight text. With minimal logging turned on, straight text, they were about 500 megs a day of just text files. So, in other words, logging is a lot in email, but, uh, you know, it's... I mean, could anybody here can live without email? No, you can't. Most people would stop sending it to me. Yeah, I get so many. I was doing good, but I'm like, two days behind. There's so much coming in. It's this guy. Yeah. Okay. So, that's MTP. A necessary, well, but a lot of us are now that we use IMAP. IMAP is kind of another version of it, okay? But a lot of us also use web based, you know, browser based email. So it's still using SMP to send mail back and forth, but we don't really mess with it that much anymore. All right. DNS Domain Name System, Domain Name Server, uses port UDP 53 but can also use TCP 53, okay? A uh, story about this. But basically, it's the phone book for the Internet, okay? Years ago, I got hired to install wireless at Buffalo Wild Wings around the city. Y'all been to Buffalo Wild Wings. I installed all their wireless. And they paid me every single month to update all this wireless. I never went out there. I, I literally, I took care of five stores. Out of all those five stores, in about a three-year time period, I went out one time to one store. They kept sending me checks every month. So I finally stopped billing them because I felt really guilty about taking their money. Because so I was like, man, every month I send them a bill, they pay me, but it's like I don't. So I felt really guilty. But when I set up their wireless, what I did was, you know, I, so if you want to make a pretty secure wireless at Buffalo Wild Wings, what do you think you need to allow? Obviously, HTTP. You agree? We want people to surf the web. Maybe they want to serve securely, so maybe some 443 as well. So port 80 and port 443. Maybe check some email, give them a 25 in there if you want to send. Maybe even a pop, pop 3, which is a 110. Set it all up perfectly. Wouldn't work. So what am I missing? I'm missing DNS. <laughs> I set all that up. I'm like, why won't this work? I'm beating my head against the wall. Now, if I knew the IP address, which I, you know, always know one, like a, I'm sure he's in, huh. This is my old company. They still haven't upgraded the mail server. It's been 10 years. But, uh, yeah, this is my old company. So, if I knew the IP address, see, I typed in the address. Went straight to it. But if I typed in the name, it didn't go to it. Okay? It's like I should be able to type, unless they change this. Nope, same place. So you see, this time I typed in the name, a minute ago I typed in the address. Okay? What happens when we type in a name, it does a name resolution to resolve the number. Then it goes to the number. Well, with Buffalo Wild Wings, I finally checked and I was able to connect via a number. I said, okay, at least it's working, but I'd forgotten the DNS. So in other words, you couldn't look up a name. So once I allowed 53, everything's up and running beautifully. So then they didn't call me literally for three years. It was crazy. Okay, um, so it's a phone book. It handles iterative and recursive queries. Kind of important. What recursive means is, say I ask Roy a question. I said, Roy, what is the weather today? Recursive, know. he must tell me the answer. Even if he has to go out and get it himself. But Roy must respond to me with the weather today. Okay? I don't want him to tell me to call Google or anything else. Roy must give me the weather. 
thing. Iterative is where I said, hey, Roy, what's the weather day? He goes, uh, I don't know, ask Google. So in other words, he referred me to somebody else. Okay? Kind of important when you're setting up your server, whether you have that on or not. It's clear in 49. So, nice. So that would be recursive. Because he did the work of figuring it out, and he came back and told me the results. Okay? Now you see here at the bottom, you can set a normal DNS query, a type A query. Now DNS comes in many record types. And A, I know some of this is like way information overload for some of you, but type A is a host record. It's the name, like whatever this one is, test.gricolocal, okay? MX would be a mail server record. Um, you know, there's just all kinds. SPF would be another mail server type record. Okay, so DNS also has zones. www.google.com, we have what's called the top level, which is the .com. We have the secondary, which would be Google, and the host name, which would be www. So if I asked you to tell me what www.google.com was, again, it's the host plus the secondary domain plus the top level domain. The way this whole system works, pretending we have never, no one in the world has ever looked up Google, what I do is I said, hey, I want to go to Google. So my machine contacts row states DNS server. Again, no one's ever been to Google in their life. It says, huh. I'm not in charge of Google, which means I'm not authoritative for Google, so I need to find it for you. And again, we've never been anywhere. We're brand new on the internet here. It doesn't even know where the heck to go. So what he does is he contacts one of the 13 root servers out there. There's 13 in the world. That's it. 11 of them went down a couple years due to some hacker business, and they still functioned. So we contact one of the 13 servers. Those are called the root servers, just a plain period, and say, hey, um, I need to talk to somebody about some dot coms the top level domain. There's com, edu, org, church, sex, everything nowadays has got this name. Okay, so the top level, whatever, the, the root servers tell me who's in charge of dot coms. Okay. Then I contact Mr. Dot com here and say, hey, you're in charge of dot coms. Tell me what this Google guy is. Then he responds back and says, oh yeah, Google's over there. So then I said, hey, Mr. Google over there, since you're in charge of Google, where's your web server at? Then he would return the address to the web server. Okay? Sounds easy. Um, years ago, again, some of you are way too young for this, but uh, I remember when, uh, remember when we had Roadrunner here in Oklahoma? Okay? Well, Cox used to be Roadrunner. Okay? They had a commercial, which you could upgrade your internet. Literally, the commercial was this guy goes, all right, I'm going to surf the internet. Goes in there and it is literally so fast. He comes out five minutes later. I'm done. Says, what are you done? With? Surf the entire internet in five minutes. That's how fast Roadrunner was. <laughs> the reason it was fast was it actually cached this information. Normally DNS is cached for a very short period of time, depending on what the server set up, the expire and the timeout and the retry settings. Well, what they did was they said ignore all that, keep it forever, pretty much. So this next time this guy went to a different dot com, he didn't have to go ask the root server where the dot com was. He didn't because he knew it all. He just kept it all. It just kept a big old database on his computer. So remember back then the internet was slower. So you're missing all them queries. You know you're missing the root server. You're missing the dot com. You're missing the Google. You just know where it is. So that's how Roadrunner was so much faster. It's it's kind of like when you know a phone number instead of looking it up. That's why it was faster. Okay? Google has a good tool to figure out which DNS server is better for you. If I just use them all the time. I use 8.8.8.8. Yeah. Or 8.8.4.4. Yeah, or 8.8.4.4. See, a lot of times people will say, oh, man, the Internet's down. No, the Internet's not down. Trust me, the Internet is not down. Maybe your area is down. Something, but a lot of times, what happens is the DNS server, DNS server will go down. So if Cox's DNS server goes down. Guess what? You have no internet. Well, you actually do have internet. You just can't resolve names. So if you happen to know the IP address of the entire internet, you could go straight to it. But forget Cox. Just use Google. The odds of Google going down are slim. So what I do in my system is is eight that eight that eight that eight is the first one, which is Google. 8.8.4.4 is my second one, which is Google as well. And then I put Cox as my third one. Now, if for some reason 
the entire Google system fails, then I can ask Cox. But yeah. never had a problem since then. My so. favorite DNS server is 10.10.0.1. Oh, yeah, that's internal here. Okay. All right. So, with DNS, we can have a couple of different types of servers. We can have primary, what's called authoritative ones. So, when I ran my ISP, I was authoritative for IntelGymnast.com, which means I managed it. So, when someone asked the .com server and said, hey, who's in charge of IntelGymnast.com? That .com server said, go talk to Ken Dewey. Because I was authoritative for it. I had the writable database that I could edit that people could query. Okay. Also a secondary or slave server, which is a copy of it. You always want to have a backup server. It's a non-writable one, but it's a copy of it. That way if the primary goes offline, you can query the secondary. Easy enough to do. Um, and the way they actually do it, which I didn't put all this in there, but they actually do it via a serial number. It's funny, if you were ever to set up a Microsoft DNS server, to this day they still do it wrong. They do serial numbers starting at 1. And every time you update the record, it goes to 2, to 3, to 4. Does anyone see a problem with that? So maybe we've got a secondary server. And what happens is the secondary asks the primary, hey, what's your number? So if the primary says I'm 12 and the secondary is 11, then the secondary will pull the update from the primary until they match. The problem is you don't know who's got the higher number all the time. So what you're supposed to do is use the date. So if I was making an edit today, I would put in 2016 02 for the first update for today. Then 02, okay, incrementing one. If we make an update tomorrow, it would be 2016 02 That way, no matter what, you could always keep track of the updates. And it's funny that Microsoft is still doing it wrong to this day. I don't know why. It's crazy. There's also caching only servers. Maybe you've got a server that doesn't contain any of these zone files. It's not in charge of Google or Intel Gymnast or anybody. All it does is cache the information. Maybe at Roche State, we don't want the computers. I mean, can you imagine, what do we got? How many computers on campus? Say 2,000? Okay, say we got 2,000 computers. Okay, so we got 2,000, and if we had no internal DNS servers, Every time someone tried to surf the web, they'd literally have to contact outside of Rose State all 2,000 machines all day long. It's a lot of traffic. So if we have a caching-only server right at the border, what happens is we would all internally ask that caching-only server and say, hey, who's Google and who's this and that and the next thing? They would go out and find it for us. And they would keep it. So then anybody else inside of the campus needs that information. We ask it, and it already knows. It's like, oh, I've been there before. Okay, so kind of cool. Way back when, when I also worked at an ISP, and way back before we had such high-speed internet, we actually had a satellite download system that every night at a certain time it would download prop, you know, popular, high-used websites to our system. So if you went to like Google wasn't around then, but say you went to Google.com. We had downloaded a copy of it already, so we had it. So when you asked for it, we gave it to you right away. We don't have to go ask for it. And so, kind of cool. But so caching holds no zones, only caches the queries. Now, you can't have a caching only one that holds a zone or two, but they don't normally do that. Okay. Forwarding, usually like it holds no zones as well. It just forwards on the requests. It's kind of like I asked him for the weather. He asked Google. He'd be like the forwarding one. He's not going to remember the weather. He just went out and got it told it to me. Okay. So are we okay on DNS? You have you're really lost, aren't you? Okay. But just think, next time you hear this, you'll be like, I've heard of that recursive thing before. Okay? All right. What's the authority? Authoritative. <laughs> Authoritative. Oh, I'm sorry. What? The authority. What Is it I can? Oh, oh. Um, that's the numbering. Okay. It's like IPv4 numbers are out of them. If you want some numbers, you have to contact them and get some numbers. Uh, I mean, for DNS, for the different servers, is there an authority that sets standards? Um, well, there is. There's got to be an RFC something. I just don't know the number. Bind was where it originally came from. Bind, which is Berkeley Internet Name Daemon. 
That's where it started the whole thing. See, originally, DNS was a text file. Right? We still use it. It's called the host file on your computer. If I went in here, we went to C, Windows, System, 32, Drivers, I don't know why it's in that stupid directory, etc. There's actually a host file right here. If I edit this file with a text pad, this is what DNS was. Originally, this file had every IP address and every server name for the entire internet. But you can see how that probably didn't last very long. So now we have DNS. The cool thing is you can actually edit this, uh, which I'm not going to show you the demo in here, but say you got some kids at home who won't get off of uh, Facebook. You can very easily go in here and say 127.0, whoops. Come. Next time someone tries to go to Facebook, it's going to go right to the local host. What we did downstairs, not with our current secretaries, this is a long time ago, back when MySpace was real popular, that's all they would do. It was literally MySpace all day long in the office. I contacted IT services, got permission. I got the IP address of Rose State's website, and I put in www.myspace.com and all the other names for MySpace, and all of them to the Rose State address, and it's safe. They never complained, but they got a lot more work done. Um, Josh, the guy who used to work here, he used to go to Fail Blog. You all know what Fail Blog? Kind of like Reddit. He used to go there all the time. But that's what he would do a lot. So I went into his system, redirected it to a website I made. They said, Josh, get back to work. <laughs> so every time he came back, typed it in, he was like, oh, that's very funny. Because it literally sent him to, you know, it's pretty funny. So, But yeah, you can very easily edit this. Now, obviously, if I was adding Facebook, I want to do Facebook.com without the www. I want to do it with the www. I want to do chat. I want to do all the different entries. But, yeah, it's very, very handy you can do that. Okay? Um, all right. So let's continue on. Um, all right. So RIP, Routing Information Protocol. That's much more of Barron's area than mine. But it's a – it's actually, what, version 3 now, I think? Version 3? It's a distance vectoring pro, uh, protocol. It keeps track of how far away something is. In other words, Dallas is 212 miles. Houston is 530 miles. You know? So basically think of it as keeping track of all the networks out there in the world based on hop count. In other words, how many routers does it have to go through to get there? Initially, what it would do was it would update its entire routing table every 30 minutes. So if each one of you was a router, those 30 seconds, I'm sorry. Every 30 seconds, I would send each of you my entire routing table. And these 30 seconds, each one of you would send me your entire... So basically, we would all be sharing this stuff every 30 seconds. Kind of crazy, isn't it? That's a lot of stuff. Then it got changed to random. It's still used today, isn't it? It's still the most popular one out there. Okay. But yeah, routing information protocol. Okay. SNMP. I got to tell you a story about SNMP. I went to the University of Tulsa, as a lot of you know. A lot of really smart people there. I mean, the school is super expensive. But they don't really teach networking there. But what they did there is every Friday, someone in the Cyber Corps, kind of like the Cyber Club, the Cyber Corps students that were there on grants would get up and talk on something. Well, this one guy, Jerry, kind of looks like him here. Uh, someone says, uh, Jerry, got a question for you. What's SNMP? Uh, it's that stuff you use to send email with. I'm like, uh, no, 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 no. SNMP is not email. SNTP is email. I was, and literally everybody in the audience is like, oh, okay. I'm like, are you freaking serious? Oh, oh, it was bad. SNMP is actually the simple network management protocol. Okay? Uses UDP 161 and 162. It basically exchanges man man management information. There seems to be a lot of vulnerabilities in this. And don't sue me, SNMP people. But it seems that there's a lot of vulnerabilities in this area. Okay? 
It uses get and set. I can get data from you. I can set data. We can set up traps where you can you know, sit there and say, okay, whenever something hits five, notify me. Okay. It uses MIB, not men in black, a management information base where it you know, gets information about different things. It has a big, huge community. But um, I used it with my ISP to keep track of my traffic. I would query my router, which kept track of all this, and I could see where the traffic's going, stuff like that. So, kind of a cool protocol, but again, it does seem to have a lot of vulnerabilities. HTTP. Is it Windows only? Oh no, it works on many things. Yeah, you the actual components you connect to can be just about anything. You can query routers, and uh, I remember when I had a credit card theft on one of my clients. One of the question was, do you monitor your CPU utilization on your firewall every 15 seconds? Is that even possible? <laughs> I mean, can you literally every 15 seconds of every single day, all that? No, but with SNMP, SNMP, you actually could. You could set up a trap that hey, when processor reaches 82. Notify me. Okay. So, kind of a cool protocol, but again, it does seem to have a lot of vulnerabilities with it. Okay. HTTP, Hypertext Transport Protocol. Many people think that's the internet. It's just a protocol to connect to the internet. It uses port 80 again by default. Back when I was a tinker, we had, you know, uh, port 552 went to the 552nd web page. Port 752 went to the 752nd web page. You probably don't do that anymore. Okay. We did way back when. Okay. It is unsecure. So if you're ever going to a website and you're putting in personal information and it does not say SHTTP, or I'm sorry, HTTPS, I get it, the wrong side there. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's not the first one, isn't it? Well, it's doing good. It's not like that, unlike that quiz I put up yesterday. What, 85 typos? Okay, but HTTPS is the secure version. So if you're doing anything that requires personal information, you need to make sure it's secure. Okay. Now, those of you that connect to our vSphere system, you'll you'll see an issue with ours. It comes up with a certificate error. That's because we generate our own certificate. It's not being provided to us from a certificate authority. Okay. We don't store any personal information. We don't even use your student IDs in that system. So don't freak out. I mean, so many people say, I can't connect. It's got a certificate error. Yes, you can. Just tell Google, please hurt me. No, it's Firefox. You say, please hurt me, isn't it? Which is the browser you say, connect anyway, and please hurt me? Wasn't that Firefox that did that? I think Google says, connect anyway. But one of them, yes, I know, it's unsecure. Please hurt me. Go or something. Okay. Use display web pages. This really, this, this three-way handshake, really need to go on the TCP slide. I put it on the last minute. The way this thing works, I'm going to talk to Roy. First thing I do is I send... A sin, a synchronization request to Roy. Back. Hey Roy, I want to talk to you. He replies back with an acknowledgement, an act saying he acknowledges it. And he also sends me a sin. He says, All right, Ken, I want to talk to you too. Then I acknowledge his. Three way handshake, and that's how a TCP connection starts. And okay, that really needed to be on the other slide. But I don't know why I put it here. Again, okay, I was rushing at the end, I'm like, because I got busy. But. So that's how TCP is actually connection oriented. It does this three-way handshake. Now you also see where I put five-way handshake. Anyone know what that's for? Yeah, it's basically HTTPS. Okay, it does the same three-way, but also transfers the encryption protocols and the certificates. So it does a little bit more. Okay. All right, DHCP. I love this one. Okay, dynamic host configuration protocol got to remember Dora. DHCP works discover, offer, request, and acknowledgement. So when I turn my computer on, I do not have an address. I send out a discovery packet. Hey, is there any servers out there? Yo. Roy, being Mr. DNS server, or no, DHCP server DHCP. now, he would offer me, hey, I'm out here. I'll give you an address. Hey, little boy. But <laughs> then I send a request packet and say, hey, I like that address. It's looking pretty good. 
Then he acknowledges it back to me, and I get to keep that address. So, Dora. <laughs> the problem with the ACP is you're really only supposed to have one in your network because it could really cause issues if you have more, especially in our vSphere system. When people teach this and they don't turn it off, then you start getting random addresses that don't work. So it causes issues. If for some reason this is turned off or not functioning, you might get a 169.254 address, which is actually what's called automatic private IP addressing. It's built into Windows. That's built in a lot of things now. I liked it because when my clients would call me, like, the Internet's down. I'm like, probably not. So I said, okay, what's your IP address? So I'd walk them to, you know, through IP config, and they're like, 169254. I'm like, okay, easy fix. Your DACP is down. DACP. So I tell them to go restart this router, fix their DACP, and they're back on. They're like, oh, you're a genius. I'm like, no, oh, it's, I was usually what I know. I mean, again, if I get 169.254, what that means is the network's working and just the DACP server's offline. Are you a wizard? Yes. <laughs> and I work with Dora. Okay. <laughs> ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. Okay. Oh, it really matches MAC addresses, which is the hardware address built into your machine with an IP address. So say I want to uh, surf to Google.com here. I've never been there all day today or anything. First thing I do is I like you know, I find out what Google's address is, their IP address. You know, I do NS look up whatever and get their address. But then I'm like, huh, is that inside my local network? So I send out, hey, does anybody know? Like they're saying down here. Um, Put the rest of it on there. They basically say, oh, there it is. Who has 10.10.01? In other words, who has this address? If it's you, tell me. Okay, that's normally internal ones there. But So I find out that Google's not inside my network. But, I, you know, if it was an internal machine I was looking for, I'm saying, who has this address? Tell this other person. So if you actually look at your network, which I don't think we have. We still have Wireshark installed in this room? We had it at one point. No, it's not in there. But wire, what happens is, whenever you try to do anything, pretty much you get an ARP request. Okay? So it basically is just resolving IP address to MAC address, the physical address. Because an IP address can change. Physical addresses can't. It's easy. Like when you're using Wireshark or something like that on your own network, I understand you're sharing your connection with pretty much your own network. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it depends. If you have a cable modem and you're, you don't have a router, yes, you're getting the entire neighborhood. But if you have a router, your router should be preventing it. And a, kind of a cool thing to do is take your laptop, plug it straight into your cable modem without a router, and you will literally see the entire neighborhood, all the requests for the entire neighborhood. Hopefully you have a router on the inside that you're using, which then the router blocks it. Hopefully. But yeah, it depends where you plug it in. So many people see Cox initially when they they weren't in the security business, so they would literally sell people cable modem and you plug the computer into it. Wow. Uh, uh, Nancy Berlin, public relations, uh, was a publicist for a lot of romance authors. She was having an issue with her computer, was screwing up and everything. So I went up there and they literally cable modem switch, not router, cable modem switch plugged into router. I mean into the cable modem. No, no, no. Who did this? Oh, Cox did. And I said, no, that's wrong. And she's like, no, no, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's wrong. So I went home. And I could see her, you know, I basically got right into her computer. And I called her and said, so Nancy, you're editing such and such a document, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, literally, your computer's wide open to the internet. I'm looking at your <laughs> computer right here. And she was really freaking out. So at that point, I, she was one of those that, no, 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 it's fine. I don't need to buy anything else. I'm like, no, you need a router. So she bought one right after that, right after that day. So it was. Can you imagine why? Yeah. Okay, Ping. There's a wonderful website here. We're not going to watch the movie. But if you've not seen this, you must watch this. It's from 20 years ago, but it is the coolest movie ever. Yeah, you've got to watch it. We're going to just. The music. You gotta watch it. See? You have the ping of death out there. It's really cool. Okay, so 
So you need to watch that. Warriors of the .net. It's not long. But it really gives you a good understanding of what the heck the internet is. And a packet. And a router. And so it's really kind of cool. Ping stands for Packet Internet Groper. Kind of like Roy. Uh, basically, with ping, ping, so I can go ping, um, BS.104-01. And what it's doing now is it's going to send four packets to my office machine and get a reply back to see if it's online. I could do it with a dash T and it would go forever. I could do dash L and change the size. So there's a lot of stuff I could do to it. Yeah, but, do it anyways. Yeah, so, we'll so basically what it does is it sends a request and a reply. to actually type A and type 0. It really only matters in a different class, especially pen testing, because you'll need to know that for that. But ping is really connectivity. I cannot ping outside of Rose State. If I type ping www.google.com, is there too many W's in there? Yeah. Okay, it's not going to work because Rose State blocks it, which is good. From your house, you should be able to do that. You could also run Trace 7 and all this other stuff. But ping, again, is for connectivity. Okay eBay, see, I can still ping eBay, but I can't ping Yahoo, because eBay and Yahoo got broken in a real bad denial of service attack years ago. They still haven't fixed it. Which, uh, well, one, I'm still allowing it. A ping, packet, internet, groper. So, now it's really just a way of con con checking for connect uh, connectivity. It's part of what's called the ICMP, Internet Control Messaging Protocol Suite. Bing, Traceroute, all of them are part of it. What Traceroute is, it's somewhat of a newer protocol. It can figure out how to get to Dallas from here, or how to get to Google. You say, Traceroute, www.google.com, and it will then tell me how to get to Google from my house, through the internet, basically. It'll show you all the hops along the way. I can't, again, I can't do it from here. We're blocked. But try that when you get home. Type Traceroute, T-R-A-C-E-R-T, -E space, www.google.com. You know, I actually come back and tell you the different, you know, the different routers it's going to. It used to be, see, now we're on Cox here, so it's pretty direct connection. But to get to my house, I used to have to go to Dallas. So if I type trace route my house address, which is in Choctaw, it would literally go through Dallas or St. Louis, and it was weird. But now we're Cox is our provider here, so it's pretty quick. So, what? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. <sighs> okay. Hopefully you got something out of that, because these protocols are talked about in many, 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 many classes. So, hopefully you got something. Any questions? I'll post the PowerPoint in the video. No, in the recording. Just yes. so everyone's clear, I would like to make this uh, blatantly.